Hey everyone, welcome back to the show. And if you're new, welcome. I'm glad that you decided to listen in or watch on YouTube. Um, just so you know a little bit about me, I am going on almost four years this December, four years of becoming an above knee amputee. For those of you watching on YouTube, you can see my socket in the video. And because I've got it reversed, it looks like it's probably on my left leg, but or my right leg, but it's actually my left leg. Um, and I just thought really quick that I would kind of tell you a little bit about this show. Um, I decided to start doing a podcast when I realized that my journey might help somebody else get through their journey. Despite the fact that I know all of our journeys are completely different, there are some things that we can help each other get through. Um, and people that helped me, I feel like it's a pay it forward kind of a, of a thing. So for those that were there for me when I was trying to make the decision for an amputation and getting through that whole process, I had months, for those of you that know my story, I had from September to December, the moment that I booked my amputation to the date I was having it, I had from September to December to think about it, worry about it, be excited about it, be nervous about it, scared to death, unsure, you name it. I think every emotion, and it wouldn't be unusual for me to just cry out of left field one day because I, the the fears and everything that I had been holding on to kind of just overwhelmed me in some weird moment. So if you are an amputee, you understand what I'm talking about. Some of you may have uh, lost a limb because of being sick or an accident. Um, I elected to, after many years of surgery on uh, a knee injury that didn't heal right, um, from karate, actually. So fighting ninjas and I hurt myself, then I lose my leg. Go figure. But what I have found is that with my journey, I know that there is certain undertones that others may actually be experiencing. And in the past couple episodes, or at least the last episode, I did make mention of how the whole insurance game could be several episodes. Now, I am by no means a an insurance broker or work with an insurance company but I've been there and I've been through all the rigmarole and all the baloney that they put you through. And I thought that this episode, you know, it was kind of funny. I woke up this morning and I thought, yeah, you know what? The Beastie Boys said it right. You have to fight for your right, but not to party. Well, yeah, you can do that too, but to um, get your prosthetic and get through the whole um, insurance game. So today's episode is about fighting for your rights. And it really is a fight. Um, before I jump into this, there might be some of you that have listened in last week. You know I was running a day late because um, I am fortunate enough to know someone that has some horses and one that I've kind of adopted. But my friend's big old, big old guy um, last week, uh, I don't know, it was Monday or Tuesday, when I went over in the morning to kind of hang with them and work on training, um, he was laying on the ground, which most horses do. The only problem is, is he's like 25 years old and he has a neurological disorder on his back hips. And when a horse, and he is like almost 17 hands, so he's a huge horse. When a horse that size with neurological issues in the hips goes down to roll, um, they tend to have a hard time getting back up. Well. This was one of those days and he wasn't getting back up. And I guess something new to me in the horse world is after so many hours of them being down, it gets to the point where do you have to put them down? And it was heartbreaking to say the least to watch my friend, um, that was her baby, um, to see her in such anguish and pain was heartbreaking to me. And all I could do was cry with her all I could do was wet him down with a wet rag because he was just in the sun and he was warm and sweating and pray over him. You know, the best thing I can do when I don't know what else to do is I pray. And I just want to let you know that Romeo is still with us. 
and I was feeding him carrots this morning and loving on him and he looks bright-eyed and bushy-tailed for 25 years old and we believe he had a couple strokes and so he looks pretty good for all of that he's been through. So I'm excited to announce that and I wanted to let you know because I know that last week when I was a day late, I did tell you why I was a day late and I didn't want you to worry about my horses. And my friend is, um, you know, trying to spend as much time as she can because she knows time is fleeting now that he's had a couple strokes. And so now is the time to um, embrace each of those moments that we so, so much take for granted. And ironically, yesterday, a Facebook um, memory of mine came up the same year that I elected to take my leg. Um, was the same year my mom passed and my mom and I were best friends. And I just remember that two months before she passed yesterday, five years ago, um, she, uh, she, uh, we surprised her, my son, younger son and I surprised her and I've never done this, but we didn't tell anybody in the family we were heading into Chicago from Arizona. And, uh, we Ubered from O'Hare airport and brought when the Uber was great. He let us stop at Starbucks to bring Starbucks. And I said it was my longest coffee date ever, or my longest journey to a coffee date. And that, um, I'll tell you what, that moment to see that come up on my timeline last night was, um, it was a gut punch that I wasn't expecting. I hadn't been on my phone at all yesterday and um, just got really wrapped up in all the things around here and my kids and, um, when that showed up last night, as I was getting ready for bed, I just, the wind got knocked out of me and, and all of a sudden that was like, it was yesterday. And, uh, so when I say you got to live in the moment, you got to live for the present because you don't know what tomorrow brings. I know it sounds so cliche, but I really hope that you enjoy the journey you're on, no matter how horrible it might be at this moment in time, there is there is something to be said about the fact that you have breath in your lungs and um, you you can make a difference with someone else in someone else's life and you can make the most of your own life no matter where you're at. So with that being said, let's jump into this because you know what? I want you to hear what my journey was on dealing with insurance companies and with the best advice I ever got. Um, I know there's some people that um, get into our social media groups that say, you know, I'm a possible candidate for an amputation. You know, I have so many problems. Will this fix all my problems? And, you know, I will tell people, you know, they'll say, will I be normal again? There is no such thing as normal in real world or after amputation. There is no normal there isn't, this worked for him, so it must work for me. This worked for her, so it will work for me. Everyone is totally different. Well, one thing I can tell you, uh, for those of you watching on YouTube, you can see my little pup curled up. That's my old girl, my 12-year-old chihuahua. She's curled up on the, the bed behind me. Um, one thing I can tell you is that no matter where you're at in your journey, um, you might be in the midst, and I do know several of you right now that are, you've had your amputation and now you're waiting, and the waiting game could be possibly the worst. Now, I know there are many of you that are listening overseas, um, in Europe, um, in Australia, you know, in Asia, Canada. I know everyone has different health care, so I can only obviously speak to what I've dealt with here in the United States. And so I'm hoping that even if you live someplace different or you have different insurance or a little bit different circumstance, um, there'll be something, some kind of um, information that you can take from today's podcast that will help you out. One thing that I, I'll tell you, there's my general practitioner he was awesome. Uh, we got very lucky when we moved to Arizona. I needed someone right away for my son and we found someone right away. And then I needed one because, you know, I started doing karate and it felt like I was breaking toes and hurting calf muscles. And he, you know, if there was times I'd come in, he'd roll his eyes and be like, now what? And he goes, maybe you should just pick up yoga instead of karate. 
until the final blow where I tore my MCL and he saw me go through surgery after surgery. And then I went into him and said, listen, I believe that amputation is the next best thing for me. Um, and he goes, you know, I think you are totally prepared for it. I don't doubt you're going to rock it. But he goes, the one thing that most people forget to deal with, because there's the emotional side, the mental side and the physical side. But there is one more aspect and that is the insurance side. The insurance side is probably worse than any of those because we we can handle what we need to handle because it's what's going on within our own body, right? Uh, my emotions, I'm in charge of my emotions. I'm in charge of the way I feel about things. I'm in the char way, I'm in charge of the way I handle my body after amputation and you know, using crutches, wheelchairs, getting around before my prosthetic. What I can't control is the insurance company. Now, with that being said, I will tell you that was probably the best advice I ever got out of everybody I saw. I knew I'd be able to make it even if I hadn't had any peer-to-peers, but I was taking for granted that we had really good insurance. We are very fortunate that my husband has a great job with really great insurance, we pay into it, an arm and a leg, no pun intended. Um, I paid in a leg at least. But um, what I found interesting was um, how much that lack of control and the unknown of insurance and how they run things was so detrimental to what I'm, what I was getting ready to go through, what I went through, and then having to deal with that on top of it. it. To say that it is a horrible thing that someone has to go through amputation and then fight for those rights is incredible. Like there's not enough going on in your life when you go through amputation, whether it's accidental or because of diabetes or cancer, like you don't have enough to worry about on all that other, other stuff, but the insurance company makes you work for it. And I'm sorry, it I, I haven't come across one person that said, oh, I had a great experience. There isn't anybody that has ever told me they've had a great experience. Now, there may be some people out there. And if you live in a different country, you know, you may have had to wait forever to get your amputation or to get in for the surgery or to get your prosthetic, but you were probably maybe didn't deal with um, insurance companies declining you. So what I did, and I want you to take this, uh, this tidbit of information away with you. And, <laughs> and I'll say this with a grain of salt, even though I did this and I thought, felt totally like prepared and ready for it, and I was, I did everything I could. The fact that I still had zero control in the end is beyond me. I mean, truly. Here's what I did. If you know anything about insurance companies and you've worked with them before, one, you know you're on the phone forever. So make sure you have your questions and, and everything you want to ask ready at hand because God knows you don't want to sit in on hold for another hour because you forgot one question. So number one, write down all your questions. Be prepared with the questions, but understand that the person that you are talking to on the phone is a minimum wage person who just answers phones. And they are told what to say based on what the computer tells them to say based on the questions you ask, okay? Also understand that if you were to call back, you're gonna get a different person. And I knew this just because I had five years of surgeries and I had to always see what was covered if we'd met our deductibles and yada, yada, yada. Okay. So what I did was this. First off, I wanted to make sure, based on the fact that I wanted a very good, strong medical team around me, not only did I obviously interview different surgeons, I interviewed them. It, this was my life. I'm interviewing surgeons. Who's the best one for the job? Who has the most experience? Who has that um, level of confidence? And quite frankly, I think you can get good bedside manners with an amazing, exceptional surgeon. You don't have to have one that's kind of an asshole that treats you like garbage and really doesn't pay attention to you to be an elite surgeon. 
I'm sorry, you can have both and I've had that. I've been very, very fortunate with my surgeon here in Phoenix, um, Dr. Judd Cummings. I'm giving you some props because you were awesome. You understood my fears, you talked me off of ledges, you were prepared, you were confident, and you supported me even after my surgery, and I love that. Your whole staff was great. So not only did I interview my surgeon, pick my surgeon that I wanted, he right away in the middle of one of my meetings with him hooked me up with a prosthetist that he trusted, believed in, and wanted me to go see. And he's like, hey, you guys at the Limb Center, David, Randy, a shout out to you guys. He called you guys up, David, he called you up and he said, I have someone here I need you to talk to. She's on the um, verge of deciding, and I think we're gonna be going through with this, but I think she has some questions, could you talk to her? And I went in and I had an appointment with two legs with a prosthetist. So that I, and, and David, who I'm referring to as the assistant, he is an above knee amputee as well, and he has been one for over 20 years. So I gotta go in and ask real questions by someone who's experienced what I'm, I'm asking. Now his was an accident, so he had a more traumatic experience to his amputation than I did, which was mine was elected um, because I figured my life would be better that way. But anyways, I had that. Then not only was that awesome, they said, here's who we would send you to for physical thera therapy afterwards. And they do a K level test, which is basically they see, and this is really important for insurance companies, they want to know what your K-level testing is. And a K-level testing is something you do normally after amputation to see how mobile you will be. And that depends on what insurance will cover for a prosthetic. If I'm like, you know, a 95-year-old woman who hasn't been out of a wheelchair for 10 years, they probably are not gonna set me up with the most expensive prosthetic because I'm already weak and fragile and I'm not you know, athletic and getting out there climbing mountains, okay? So what I did is I actually went in and saw the physical therapist before my amputation, did a K-level test with my really bad bum leg and um, you know, got the highest level and then we submit that to the insurance company. Now I say all this because if you can at least get together with a prosthetist that you're gonna use, that your insurance company, it's in network, they can tell you the codes for the type of leg they are going to try to get for you. Those codes are very important because that's what you're gonna use when you call your insurance company and you're gonna say, here's the code, I need to know if this is covered and you go through a couple different codes and it's usually for me it was the electronic component which is the most expensive part and it's one code i just needed to know we knew the foot would be okay and the ankle bone part would be okay and the socket was going to be okay because that's all general basic stuff it was the type of of either hydraulic knee or electric knee you know it's not powered it's electric there's difference powered kind of is a device that helps especially um, like paraplegics stand, it's powered. It actually thrusts you up into standing and helps you walk. If you've ever seen any of those, almost like leg braces they put down on both sides to help people that can't walk, walk. Those are powered. Mine's electric because it's plugged in, but it doesn't move me. I have to move it, okay? So you need to know the difference between powered and electric. And then hydraulic is kind of the the most or the cheaper of them all and it basically doesn't have the devices and the capabilities to control your gait you have to do all that and be very careful how you walk and there's lots of people that use hydraulics one because that's all their insurance covers or two because that's their k-level testing that they tested too and that's all the insurance would cover and they're expensive no matter what kind of leg you get it's expensive so once you know the code, here's what I did. I actually, since I had a lot of time, and some of you may not have this, but I would still suggest even in a truncated time frame, do the same thing. 
I called the insurance company, I think once a month, I had four months, I called them four separate occasions and asked the exact same question. Here's the code that my prosthetist gave me. This is the leg, the knee I need to get. Is this covered by my insurance? And they would go in, they'd go into our insurance, um, what we had our plan and yes, it's covered. Okay, you sure that is, I need that component. Yes, it's totally covered. Awesome. Hang up. A month later, I'm like, I'm just going to call again. I know I was going to get somebody different. So I wanted to see if the second person would give me the same answer. And I didn't just get someone that was like, yeah, you're covered. You're fine. Because they really don't understand how that's going to affect us in the long run when it's just their day job. So then I called a second time, asked the same question. Is this code covered? Yep, it is covered. Under your plan that you have, it is covered. Awesome. November comes. Called again. Hi, I'm just calling. I wanted to make sure. I've called before, but I just want to make sure that with my plan for our insurance coverage, that if I go through this amputation, this code is covered. Yes, it is covered. And then I did it one more time in December. I think my surgery was December 18th. Um, I did it at the beginning of December. So four separate times, four different people, four yeses, it's covered. That's what you need to do. You don't wanna take one and then let that be it. You just wanna make sure that different people are giving you the exact same thing. Cause you don't want someone that's had a bad day at work that is like, yep, everything's covered. Yep, everything's covered. Yep, everything's covered. Everybody they call that calls them, they just say yes, cause they just wanna get off the phone, okay? Not that anybody would do that, but you never know and it's your life. So you need to fight for your rights, okay? So I did all that. That was the deciding factor. I thought if I could get the leg that they think I should get, and I saw it in action with David at our the, at the prosthetist, prosthetist office, I knew that I would be successful. I could do this. So that was the decision. I'm going to do the amputation. We are set to go. I'm not canceling it. We're doing it. December 18th rolls around, I go in, I was ready. I was excited for what was to come, that I could do anything, try anything. I knew it would be hard, but I went in with a really positive, upbeat attitude, making jokes that day and everything. Get up the next, or that evening, it was a late surgery, that evening, woke from um, anesthesia and I was feeling great. It was, of all the surgeries I've had, this was the best one I've ever woken up from. I'm the kind of person that like throws up after every surgery and I have to warn them, listen, I do this. Please don't wait till I wake up to give me something. It has to be in my drip. And so they finally learned because some people said, well, we'll just give you something when you get up. And then it was, you know, a fraction of a second too late. So I get up, everything's great. Um, the, that night I'm up walking with crutches. That next morning, OT and PT come in, everything's great. Um, I'm able to use the bathroom on my own with crutches. I'm walking up and down the, the hallway. They're like, you're looking great. You're ready to go home. That's awesome. The healing begins. So the first step then is getting home, making sure that you have obstacles out of your way. Um, we had a huge lab at the time and um, she liked being underneath me and my husband is extremely protective. So lock the dogs up when I first come in get my body on a couch, get my leg up and away from the dogs because you have all these staples in it and and then release the hounds. And so they got used to being careful around me and everything and healing was good. It took a little bit longer than I wanted because I had one section of my um, incision that would not totally close up. You do not want to be putting on a prosthetic um, on a, a semi-opened wound and that is so hard to be patient because you're getting used to not having that excess weight. So when you have an amputation, like for me, I lost about 10 to 12 pounds of mass. Like that, that's how much my leg that was missing um, weighed. So your body has to find its new equilibrium and balance. Um, you, you know, you got to build up the strength, your arm strength and your um, leg and hip strength. Your core has to be top notch, you know, you have a, 
hospitalist that comes to your house, checks you all your vitals. Um, I had a PT come to the house and work on some basic things, talk about phantom pains that I was feeling, tried mirror therapy, yada, yada. Um, when I finally did get the staples out and it was time to move forward, we, um, we, we put our request in for my prosthetic probably a month before I was ready to get it. Like it was just before I got cleared so that we weren't behind and waiting, waiting, waiting more than needed. So once I started to heal and they said, okay, you got a couple more weeks, that's when we started the paperwork. And believe it or not, it came back as denied. <laughs> and I was like, excuse me? And, and Randy and David are like, they denied it. I'm like, how is that possible? Four different people on four different occasions said it, was a, it would be approved because it was covered. Well, they say, they're saying it's not covered. Now is when you hear this from your prosthetist, but it's really your fight now. And I'll tell you what, talking about it just still, um, it kind of just deflates me and, and exhausts me. I know there are people that go months and even years before they're approved. Um, depending on their insurance, depending on how much they pay into insurance, depending on what kind of leg they want to get, depending on where you live, depending on your economic status, et cetera, et cetera. But I'll tell you what, I wouldn't wish any of that time frame, whether it's a day of being denied or a year of being denied, there is, there is some serious mental anguish that happens and the emotional drain uh, was was enough of a gut punch and it destroyed me for a month for a month I was in charge of my my destiny and that's when I had to fight and I'm typically not a fighter but you know what this was this was my life this is what was going to become of me I called every single day Monday through Friday asking about this. I even called the, the insurance person at Autobach, who my leg is made by, and asked him for some help. He was the one that actually found out why it was being denied. So here's what happened. September, October, November, December, I called and asked the same question, got the same answer, right? Everything was going to be approved. In January, a brand new year, they decided to rewrite their, their plans and they put my electric leg under powered and powered is not approved in my plan. So no matter what I did, this was just the game I was going to have to play. And I fought and I'll tell you Friday, Friday afternoons were the worst because if I didn't hear anything back Friday after my call, I knew I had to wait Saturday, Sunday before anything would happen and Monday I'd start all over again. I ended up going through a manager, a manager to the manager, and a manager to that branch manager. I talked to the highest up people. They were all good. They were all very helpful and they wanted to fight for me because it isn't their, it is what they are told to do and say based on what the company's policy is and they just work for the company. They aren't the ones that make the policy, just like the person on the phone does not make the policies. They just read what it says in the policy. They translate it to you so you can understand it. That's it. So I had people, what I did, and this is key, I let them know because they wanted to know what my policy number was, what my, per, my, my number was, my insurance number. But I made them realize that I was a normal person my name, I would say my name. I would let them know I was a mom, that I had things I had to do. I had to be able to function. I had to make dinner with crutches. My wrists were starting to hurt from the overuse of crutches. And I started making it very personal. And that's when I started to get those managers on my side, is when I started making it personal. I am a person. I am not a number. I am not someone you can just talk to, hang up and go home and have your dinner. 
I am a person that once you hang up, my life still sucks and I am down a leg and it's not coming back. And I chose and I told them I chose to do this because I was told it was covered. And because they decided to change their plan after I made the decision, after the surgery happened, they changed the plan on me. Now, one thing you have to remember too is that insurance companies, when they call, they say this um, phone call will be recorded for quality assurance, right? Well, guess what? They were able to look back and they said, yeah, you know what? You did call four times and each time you got that answer. That helped me immensely. But ironically, when I got really frustrated and wasn't getting answers, I said, I would like those transcripts. And they said, you would have to get a lawyer and subpoena them. My own transcripts, I would have to get those. So you may even think about getting some of this in writing by email and also audio recording the conversations that you're having, like putting it on um putting it on speaker and recording what you're talking about with this person on the line just to cover your own butt. Whatever you have to do, because no matter what I did to prepare, I still got the rug pulled out from underneath me. Now here's the kicker. They finally agreed to doing it. And you know what they told me? <laughs> Keep in mind that at the time I was 48, they said, all right, we're approving it because of what had happened and you called and you were told it was covered, but this is a one-time deal. Anybody see a problem with this being a one-time deal? Um, it's an electronic component. I'm only 48 years old. I'm hoping to live to maybe 90. I'm not sure these legs were meant to last that many years without crapping out. They're electronic. And as a matter of fact, what I did find out and know ahead of time is that the, your rights are that at three years, you should have between first to third year before you go to reapply for a new leg, you should make sure you have it refurbished and cleaned up and checked. And I did that. I had components that already were going because I am like all over the place. I, you know, I hike all the time and I'm skiing and I'm surfing and I'm doing all these things that my leg had gotten beaten to snot. And so they, they had to change out several components. Then a few months after that, we said, okay, we need to get a new leg for you. And that's what my prosthetist said, okay, you're at the three year mark. And when I went to apply for my three year, which is supposed to be when you're supposed to get a new leg or an updated leg, they denied it again. Now, this time wasn't as traumatic to me because I had one that was working and I could fight while I was still walking. Before, I didn't have anything and I thought, oh my God, I'm never gonna walk again. That's what I was worried about. So this one time I fought, I fought a little bit harder, but didn't have to fight as long and kind of got approved. I have to say that I'm very fortunate for the company my husband works for because they made up the difference. So insurance company still won on that one. And thank God my husband works for an amazing company that really cares for its employees. And so they covered the difference that the insurance company wouldn't uh, cave on. So even though I got my new, new brand new leg, um, we still had to pay for it a little bit more. But like I said, we are very fortunate for who we work with. And that isn't the case for everybody, but I will tell you, you must fight. I have had people come to me and say they've been denied and they're, they're just done. And I'm like, you've got to fight. They all insurance companies, once they hit a certain point, uh, price point on, a an item, they're going to say, no, that's just their first response. No. And they will f realize that they gamble that knowing that a majority of the people aren't going to fight past the no. But you make enough stink and it's that, you know, squeaky wheel gets the oil. That's what you need to do. You need to fight. This is your life. You tragically lost a limb. You deserve to feel like you um, have value to give and you do need that assistance. Because you know what? Without my leg, I'd be on crutches. 
with the crutches, I was noticing my shoulder joints were hurting more and my wrists, I was getting carpal tunnel. So then I was going to PT for carpal tunnel during that time of healing. And then the month that I spent trying to, to win that argument that they had screwed me over. So I don't know why insurance companies would want to deal with surgeries to deal with the problems that are residual problems from you know, not having the right equipment to make you a healthy, happy individual. And we all want that, right? I want you to be a warrior. I want you to be out there and I want you to give it your best. No matter how hard you go in life, you still deserve to be able to put in money to an insurance plan and then get rewarded for that when you need it most. They shouldn't make people that are already struggling with the life they've been dealt by making them work even harder just to get some basic necessity. And I believe that mobility is a basic necessity. Like food and water, mobility makes people happy. When we're happy, we're healthier. And we can give more, uh, give back to the world more and, and, and be vital to our community. So all I can say is you need to cover your butt. And in every aspect of that, you, before surgery, and if you are unfortunate enough to have had an accident and you woke up and you don't have your limb and you didn't even know that was going to happen, I know you're dealing with that tragedy and that is hard enough. Hopefully you have a support system that can actually help and make those calls and push you forward with the insurance companies but you can't give up, okay? You just don't give up. They say no to everyone. I mean, my legs, they say, cost $60,000 to $100,000. I don't know where they get these numbers, it's insane, but they are gonna say no to that because that's a big chunk of change for them that they can keep for themselves. And I'm sorry, that is what the insurance companies do. They wanna say no first, and then if you say, oh, okay, they just won and they don't have to worry about anything else. And they just kept all that money. They didn't lose it. But they, they are, they're going to be listening if you keep calling and pushing and make it personal. Make your name known and tell them, you know, you get off the phone and guess what? I've got to try to figure out how to make dinner for my family on crutches. Do you know how hard that is to move from one section of the kitchen to the other with a pot of water for pasta even, you know, I mean, it's, I did it. It's hard. Um, and it's, it's kind of dangerous too. I think I had pretty good stability and core strength and leg strength because I hurt myself in, in, in an athletic event. Um, and not everybody is that coordinated. I know a lot of amputees, even younger ones that don't have that same coordination. I mean, you've seen people, right? There are people that are coordinated and some that aren't. You take away a leg, you take away the balance that God gave us. Um, some people do not ever get a grip on that. And I know several amputees that end up falling and breaking wrists and stuff and ripping up their skin because they fell, you know, just when their leg is off and, and they were on crutches. Crutches can be very dangerous. So, Anyways, that is my soapbox for today, but I'm hoping this helped you um, see that you can fight and you can win, but you need to understand that you are more valuable than all those things combined and that you deserve to have that mobility and that reassurance that you can move forward in life with the right equipment that, especially if you're paying into an insurance, you should be able to get. Like I said, everybody comes from a different part of the world and everybody has different types of insurance plans and economic status. But I think in a nutshell, pushing for your rights, being that squeaky wheel, you know, give them a headache. I mean, you know what? I know it stinks, but do you want to try to live your best life or do you want to just roll over and let somebody dictate what what your future holds. You deserve better than that. So I hope this helped you. Um, really no call to action today because I just, just fight for yourself, okay? that's That would be your call to action. Fight for what you want. 
How badly do you want it? How badly are you willing to fight? Because insurance is going to make you fight. It, they just will. Um, I haven't heard of anybody yet that has gotten what they needed and what they asked for for that kind of money right off the bat without a little bit of a fight or a little bit of a um, roadblock. So be prepared. Fight for yourself. Okay, stand up for yourself. And if you struggle doing that, hopefully you have a spouse or a support system around you that can kind of lift you up and push you. And if you have questions, reach out to me. I'd be more than happy to talk to you one-on-one -on -one and, and see where you're at and what you need to do to make this work for you. Um, like I said, I'm, I'm not an expert, but I've been down this road. I've had to fight. I've, I know what it feels like to feel denied and thinking that my life will be over at that point in time and the heartache that belongs with that. And so if you need anything, please jump and reach out to me, DM me, whatever it takes, but fight for your rights, okay? Like the Beastie Boy says, fight for your right to party. Fight for your right, okay? Insurance company doesn't deserve to do that to you. I hope this helped. I hope you have a beautiful week. I hope you're enjoying the change of weather, the time change. We in Arizona did not have a time change. I love that. I love that my Chicago family is now only an hour difference from us versus two hours. And um, yes, I am the crazy person that already has all of her Christmas stuff up and Christmas music going. <laughs> Not all the time, but occasionally some Christmas music going just to, you know what, if that brings me joy, then that's what I, I do. And, it, and my kids love it. So we are the Christmas folks in November. Well, I hope you have a great rest of your week. And as always, be healthy, be happy, be you.